Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achirno and welcome to episode 5 of Game Programming. Okay, so today we're going to actually do something really cool. Um, well, actually, we're sort of not. Like, we're going to explain some really cool stuff, but we're not actually going to be able to get anything onto our screen really cool just yet, just because I want to make sure that you guys um, understand everything. So, what we're going to do today is actually talk about buffer strategies, or particularly, you know, graphical um, buffering, data buffering. So, at the moment, we've got this window that we created last uh, time and all it is at the moment is just if I run it you'll see um it is just a just a window with uh you know running being printed over and over again in the console so we'll just delete this line of code because that was just for testing purposes um basically what's going to happen is while the game's running it's going to serve two two sort of parts of um of code is going to be repeated over and over again and essentially you d you can divide games into into two parts, right? One is like the logic of the game. So in other words, um, you know, stuff like calculations onto where you move, um, ac acceptance of like keyboard input events or mouse events. Um, I don't know, processing uh, where you shoot towards, you know, handling stuff like um, multiplayer stuff, for example, like sockets and um, networking. Anyway, the list goes on. There's that part, and then there's also the part of actually rendering images to the screen. So, in other words, putting, putting, you know, drawing the player onto the screen and the environment onto the screen. So, there's like a graphical part, and then there's like a logic part. Now, the reason that there's two different parts, and we don't dump everything into, say, the rendering part, like, why can't we just say, you know, something like, um, uh, something like, I don't know, do game for example why can't we why, why can't we make a method called do game and that'll handle the rendering and like the logic stuff all in one now the reason we actually cannot do that is because of timing issues everyone has a different computer right now and if i make a game for you guys and give it to you and tell you you know open up fraps and tell me what fps you get tell me what frames per second you get on that game like tell me how you how your computer handles that game, how that game performs on your computer, you will all give me different numbers. Guaranteed, every single one of you will give me a different minimum, average, and high on, the F on, on an FPS benchmark. Now, the reason for that is all of you guys have different configurations. One of you might have a supercomputer which runs this game at 1,000 frames per second, and someone else might have a laptop or a netbook which is running at a 20 frames per second. Now, the problem with that is like, literally, that is how games work. If you see the number 1,000 frames per second, what it's doing is it's actually, you know, completing all the code in the game 1,000 times every second. It's calculating everything 1,000 times a second. So, in other words, if we tell it, okay, let's move the player at a rate of one pixel per frame, then we're going to be moving one pixel per frame, but not per second, because remember, one pixel per frame, that frame, the amount of frames that your computer fits into one second, into one second depends on the speed of your computer, on the performance of your computer on this game. So in other words, to simplify this down to people who might not, might not understand, what I'm saying is, people with faster computers will essentially run the game faster, meaning that their character will move faster. People with slower computers, their character will move slower. Obviously, that is unacceptable, and we need to normalize this so that we actually move at, so that the player moves at the same rate, no matter what he's playing on. No matter if he's having 100 frames per second or, or 1,000 frames per second, the player obviously should still move at the same speed. So to handle this, we actually need a timer. Now we're not going to go over this now, but Essentially, we need one part of the code which actually handles things like play of movement, like logic, like key and mouse input events, control input events, all of that stuff, the logical stuff, the stuff that gets calculated and actually works out how much, you know, animation, for example, how much something moves. That's just one example of it as well. There's tons of stuff um, related to that. And then we need one part of the game which actually is unrestricted, which can run at 1000 frames per second, and that handles the rendering. So in other words, we split this up into two different methods. One is called update, and this update method, sometimes it's referred to as tick, 
okay? Tick and update, it depends on how you want to call it. A lot of game programmers, not just Notch, call um <laughs> call their uh, methods tick instead of update. That's quite a convention. Um, I prefer to call it update personally. I've sort of mediated over the years. Um, I called it tick for a while just because tick was shorter and sort of, you know, you, you could say ticked and stuff like that and it would work more than um, updated. But um, I've sort of gone more mainstream and gonna update now. And then there's the render method. So these are two methods that we're about to create called update and render. Now the update method is gonna handle all the logic. It's basically gonna update our game. And the render is gonna actually display images to our screen. Now update, we will restrict to running 60 times per second uh, in the future. And render will be unlimited. So in other words, as we'll be rendering as fast as we can, but updating not as fast as we can. We'll be updating at a specific speed. To, uh, to ensure consistency throughout um, computers. Um, all right, so we'll create these two methods now simply by typing public void, they'll both, be, they'll both be void. Public void update, that'll be the update method which we're not gonna talk about today or do anything to. You can see the uh, error goes away because we've actually created that method. Um, and then we'll make public void render and that's where we're gonna spend most of our time at today. So the render method, is, as you can imagine, gonna handle rendering. Now, we're gonna dive into buffering today and we're gonna take this slow. Like it's probably gonna take us two to three days. So that means two to three episodes, maybe even four episodes to actually finish this render method and actually get a black box onto the screen or a colored box, whatever. Um, because I really want you guys to, to know the process behind why this works and how this works, not just um, what, what code you need to write. So, to start off, I'm just gonna create a buffer strategy, essentially, that's all I'm doing here. I'm creating a buffer strategy. Now, what is a buffer, first of all? And again, I know there's like, I don't know, a lot of you sitting there being like, oh, are you, are you kidding me? This guy's gonna explain what a buffer is. Chill, okay? I know that some of you are very, very smart and you, you already know all this stuff. And some of you do not, okay? There's half of you literally saying, you know, skip over the boring stuff. I already know it. And then there's the other half of, of you going, dude, this is great, I'm, I'm learning so much. So just chill, all right? Seriously, there's like this huge war going on on Reddit um, as to the speed that I have to explain things. So in other words, it's better to explain everything and satisfy everyone than to explain half the stuff and only satisfy half of you. So just chill. All right, so what is a buffer? A buffer, you can think of a buffer pretty simply. It's basically like, a temporary storage place, all right? So when we calculate something, we don't necessarily need to actually apply that data straight away. We can just, we've calculated it, great. Let's put it onto like the ready list. And then, you know, when we actually need that data, we can, whoop, we can grab it. So in other words, what we're saying is, we've rendered an image right now. It's already, it's already done. The image is completely rendered. We're ready to put it onto the screen, but we don't need to yet because we've rendered it, but like, we're still on the previous frame. We need, we need to actually store that, that, that frame somewhere. Now, the best way to explain this um, is probably just to show you guys. Now, in comes paint.net, um, and those of you who have been uh, long, long-term subscribers of mine, uh, probably, um, you know, see me use this all the time in my 3D game programming series, because paint.net is it's really good for explaining things. Um, Think of it this way, right? This is our screen. This is the computer monitor. Um, and this is, uh, it's embarrassing. That's just made it even worse, doesn't matter. Um, this, is our, this is our computer screen, right? So when we're rendering things, we can't actually render it live. What you might think is happening, and again, this is happening very, very fast, remember, because most games to be actually really smooth and playable, um, need to run, need to run it at at least 30 frames per second, if not 60 frames per second for more like Twitch shooters, like first person shooters and stuff like that. This is happening like a lot of times, this is happening like 30 to 60 times a second minimum. So it's happening very fast. You can't really see um, the rendering going on, but we can't actually render it on, onto the screen because what happens is when your computer renders things, it, it, goes, it, goes, it goes like one by one by the pixels. It fills up every pixel with the appropriate color. Um, and thus, you know, that makes up an image. Now, the problem 
the problem is that if we're doing this live, what you'll actually see is a black screen and then, you know, every pixel being updated live. Now that's a problem because that results in, as you can imagine, graphical issues. We're seeing an image being updated one by one because the computer's going, going ahead and being like, all right, this color used to be blue, now it's red, let's change that. Oh, it's red now. Um, and the problem with that is that, you know, that's happening live in front of our eyes and we don't want that to happen. We sort of want, to ha want, to, want that to happen behind the scenes. We want to be able to calculate the color of every pixel on our screen, store it somewhere, you know, as a buffer, and then, you know, when, we're, when we actually advance to the next frame, we pop that image in and wow, look at that. We've already got an array of pixel colors worked out for us. We just need to actually display them and that's what the graphics card does. So in other words, what we're saying is that rendering, right? Okay, first of all, I, I know half of you are probably screaming right now. Um, we're not gonna be using the, the graphics card to render, all right? This is gonna be pure Java. We're not gonna use OpenGL. We're not gonna use anything. I will create a series in the future using OpenGL, just not right now. It takes a long time to explain. I don't have time right now. And I find that especially for people who are new to game programming, OpenGL is a horrible way to go. You wanna learn how to do it from scratch. You wanna know how, how computer graphics work first, and then you can dive into OpenGL for hardware acceleration and to actually get the graphics card to process and render pixels. Not, not in this series. So um, we're only using the, gra the graphics card to actually display the final image onto the screen, not to actually compute, process, calculate, render the actual images. So just no, no we're not doing that. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, these episodes are getting longer and longer, so uh, I need to get back to work. Um, quickly, though, um, mm -hmm. all right. So essentially, we don't wanna have um, it rendering live. We want like, I guess we want like a, here we go, this might help. Um, essentially what we want is like, we want a temporary storage place where we can work all this out, and then suddenly we'll be like, all right, this frame's up, it's all, we've already worked everything out, Let's pop it into our screen now. It's ready, it's computed, it's calculated, everything's fine. Now the thing is, we actually need to create a place for this to be. In our computer's memory, right, in our RAM, we wanna create an area called a buffer strategy, really, um, to actually store this thing. We need to create a buffer because essentially what a buffer is, again, is it's, it's a temporary place for storage. Right, a data buffer is it's 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 a region of physical memory, um, which can temporarily hold data where, while it's being you know moved from one place to the other. So this will only be here for like maybe one sixtieth of a second, but it needs somewhere to be, um, and we need to create that that area. So we can do that simply by first of all uh, drawing a, on Java's buffer strategy object. So buffer strategy, we'll we'll just call it BS, right? Short for buffer strategy, um, and then we'll set that equal to simply get buffer strategy. Now remember, where um, and then let's import buffer strategy, obviously. Okay. Now remember, we're actually extending canvas here. So what canvas comes is with its own pretty much buffer strategy. So all we need to do is just simply retrieve the buffer strategy of our canvas object, which is our game class now, because it's a subclass of canvas. We need to retrieve that, that, um, that data and simply apply, you know, the current buffer strategy that we already have because we're extending canvas. We just need to actually be able to manipulate that now. So we um, create an object called BS so that we can actually access um, the buffer strategy. So we've, we've got the buffer strategy now, um, like the buffer strategy object, I guess, of the canvas class. Now we need to actually create it. So we've, we've got it, we're able to manipulate it, we have to create it now. So, the reason, the, the thing is, right, this is being, this is being called, remember it's in a while running loop, this is being called this method uh, like 60 times a second, oh, sorry, more than 60 times a second, as many times per second as we possibly can because it's in the render method. We don't want to create buffer strategies every time we actually render, that's, no, <laughs> literally we only, need, we, we only need to do that once. So what we can type is, an, is a simple if statement, right, really simple. If buffer strategy, if BS, if this, if this object is equal to null, then create buffer strategy. And then we'll put three 
in the uh, in the parameters, and I'll explain all this in a second. And then we need to return. <clears throat> so what this is doing is it's saying that if if the buffer strategy kind of doesn't exist, right? Because buffer get buffer strategy is returning null for some reason, which means that it's returning nothing because get buffer strategy is equal to null. It hasn't been created yet. Um, and hang on a minute. Yeah, so you can see that what that does is it returns the buffer strategy used by this component, and this component being the uh, the canvas class. So if if the canvas class is returning null for the buffer strategy because it hasn't been created yet, then we execute this code, which is we create a buffer strategy with triple buffering, and then we return. So in other words, we get out of this method. Now quickly, create buffer strategy creates a buffer strategy. Yeah, pretty pretty self-explanatory. Now the three. Now the three. <laughs> The number inside here seems to be um, very important enough for debate. You pretty much always want to have it at three. There are very few, if any, circumstances where I would recommend you leave it at two, for example, for just standard double buffering. Three is the number to go. Now, I'll explain my reasoning for this. First of all, what we, what we want to do, what we need to do is multiple buffering, right? Because with with two, Right. If we put two here, essentially we're saying, right, so there's this, there's this area and then there's this screen. So we calculate here and then we, and then we, we put it right to the, to the screen. Now, if we put three here, what we're saying is that, oh, hang on a minute, we've got another area. We've got triple buffering now. What we've got is, is like another, another, like a midpoint almost. So in other words, what, what can happen is if our computer actually manages to render a few images at once, for example, uh, I don't know if we have multiple um, CPU cores, all of that stuff. If we actually have time to start rendering a third image, we can actually store two images in memory, right? Because what happens is we can actually, you know, if, if we were using double buffering, we would actually, our program would actually have to wait until this, this image is displayed to the screen before we can start rendering the next one. Now, with, with triple buffering, that's not the case because what happens is there's two back buffers and they can immediately, you know, start drawing the, the next one, um, which basically gives us a speed improvement because we can actually work, we can actually start work on calculating the next frame before our our backup frame is displayed. So I'm not gonna get too much into this, but I guess another way actually real quick. Um let's go I don't know about six hundred. Um another way real quick to, to say this is let's just say we've got um oops I'm gonna go black. And there's no black in the default presets. That's weird. Okay. Um we've got this is the screen. I should probably show the screen in like green. This is the screen, right? And then this is our back buffer. So what happens is this is the image, this is the image that's displayed on the screen. And this is our back, our back buffer. It's like our, um, you know, our place to calculate the, um, the, the next frame. Now, if we've got another one, what can happen is this is the image currently being displayed. And we've already got two waiting in the background. So essentially, instead of just waiting, we can, instead of just having our computer wait to display the next image, um, it can actually start work on the second one. So instead of just the, the process of going completely idle for a few milliseconds or even nanoseconds, and we'll keep it at milliseconds. Um, instead of the, pr the process of not doing anything for nanoseconds or milliseconds, it can actually start work on a third one, meaning that um, that will be ready and you'll actually be able to um, have two things ready. So in other words, what we're doing by creating a triple buffering strategy, and I'll just get out of that, is again, it's just going to be a speed improvement. It's going to be as simple as that. It's just going to let us, let us have three buffers, which, um, yeah, which is just going to help us out. Now, in case you guys are wondering, well, if three buffers are so good, why don't we just go up to 10 or four or something? There's, there's pretty much no advantage in doing that. I'm just going to tell you straight away, that's not going to actually um, give you any real world results in which you have a much faster thing. So keep it at three. 
that's honestly going to be as simple as that. Hope you guys um understood something out of that. Um, <clears throat> and tomorrow we'll uh, we'll continue on with this. So I'm going to go back to studying right now because uh, that was a lot of time I just wasted. Well, I wouldn't say wasted, but um, a lot of time I just spent. So yeah. Anyway, I'll um I'll see you guys later. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.